So now I'd like to open it up to the uh, panel, panel members for questions. And, uh, the audience, if you have any questions. Mark, you talked about the value of information and um, you know the importance of that for making decisions on whether to pursue additional clinical testing. As you know, the, the formal techniques for VLI are extremely complicated and the information requirements of simply doing that kind of analysis are also difficult to meet. Um, I was wondering if you could speculate a little bit about just how promising you think these techniques are as it relates to future planning of uh, clinical development. So, um, not being a numbers guy, uh, I'm one of those who couldn't possibly do a VOI analysis. Um, and I know that um, particularly um, in England and in Europe, NICE has really embraced the concept of VOI analysis. And uh, if you go to Society for Medical Decision Making, it's received wisdom that a VOI analysis really makes sense. But as you point out, um, not everybody's sophisticated enough to do it and it takes actually some effort. Um, I think the, the uh, process of thinking you can do on a more informal basis to ask the question, um, what is the, what are we, what, what is, what, what am I answering? You know, and there are some things which are very obvious, you would think. If you're going to be exposing a asymptomatic population to potentially a life, lifetime preventive therapy, you want to be really clear that it doesn't have any harms that are going to offset that benefit. And so you'd probably be willing to spend a quite good deal of money to, to figure that out. On the other hand, if you have someone who is dying from a treatment, I mean, dying from a, a disease which is going to be fatal in the next three months, and there is no existing treatment for it, you're going to accept a lot less rigorous evidence. You might try things in an observational context to figure out whether you know whether you have something to do because you know the alternative there is no good alternative I'm not sure you have to go through a formal VOI analysis for everything but I do think it is worthwhile and it would be beneficial if in every study that gets published people say here's why I chose to do this current study design and they would have a reason why they chose to do a uh, non-experimental study versus an RCT and say, here's why I did it, to show that they went through some sort of informal process to say, this is not only, I only did it not because it was convenient because I had a data set to do it on, but I also thought it was the right way to answer that question. How do you respond to that? Um, you know, that sort of shutting the study down and saying we're not going to publish because there must be some undetected bias that means the study, the data was no good or the methods were no good. This is wrong. Okay, so there, there were a lot of questions in there, I think, but maybe I'll go to the central question is when there's that big disparity and, and how do you use that information? You know, I, I think this goes back to a very fundamental principle that maybe all of us share, which is when we're doing the research, identifying what those biases are up front and specifying how you're going to address them is a key component to getting to sort of the finish line on a given study. The idea that we don't put the data out there or that it's not published, to me, to be honest with you, I think that's sort of weak, right? And now there's obviously journals and the publication biases that we see there, but the evidence that people are putting out sort of needs to get out there to sort of inform the collective understanding of the information when in fact there's a big difference. Take for example the clinical trial orientation that, that, that Jesse spoke of. We design studies to maximize the opportunity to demonstrate benefit and minimize risk. When the drug gets into the real world, lots of people that never were studied got get it with lots of conditions, contraindications, issues that reasonably are things that potentially can produce problems. I don't think that's to say that that data is not then useful. If you don't get the same effect, maybe it's not the same when you give it to a population that wasn't studied that has the exact same clinical criteria. So, you know, I think there's a balancing act here. And, and the balancing act is, if you're looking at the data, was the study design, the design, was it right? Did you ask the right question? Did you design it the right way? Did you use the right kinds of statistical tools and design tools. 
I, I'm hoping that as we evolve and we see papers like Marx and others, Nancy Krieger and a lot of other people that are thinking about this, that the collective body looking at research is saying, what are the basic tenets of good studies? And then we can say, if we've done that, then maybe the results that we're seeing in this real world data application are in fact true. And there are subpopulations where there is risk. And that's important. And we should actually be taking that to regulators and saying, hey, maybe we need to relabel. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of value to going forward. We just, I, I, I'm, I'm constantly frustrated by the notion that just because it's not experimental research that it doesn't have value because of the potential biases. I think that's why we're all here, is trying to make that better. And you know, I, when I speak to a lot of people who deal with these issues, they immediately make this one zero dichotomy and everything else goes out the door. I don't think we're moving forward if we're doing that. I, I don't know if I answered your question. But yeah, can, I, can I add something to that? So, I mean, the intention, um, and if you look at Sebastian's paper, um, if you do, if you decide you want to look at the effectiveness of some treatment in the real world, and you find out your point estimate is very different than it was in a clinical trial. And then you redo your analysis now, but you restrict the analysis to a population that looks like the clinical trial. And now you get a result that looks like the clinical trial. And you publish both analyses. There is greater credibility that if you did both analyses the same way and adjusted for the same confounders and all the other things you should be doing, then the credibility of the first analysis about that's what you get in a broader population is more believable. So it's not that you should be restricting to reproduce the clinical trial, but if your result doesn't make sense to you or there is some, or you don't know why you got a result or people are unhappy with the result that they got, if you can do that same analysis on, another, on the same data set but now restrict it to something that looks like the clinical trial data set, and you get the same result as the clinical trial, then it, you didn't do something obviously wrong. Now, if you restrict it to the same population as the clinical trial, and you get a result wildly different than what was in the clinical trial, you might have a hypothesis there are unobserved confounders, which you aren't able to adjust for, that's affecting your result. And that's also worthwhile to know. And then there are ways to, there may be statistical methods to go after that as well. But the point is, is that whether you get um, reproducibility, going in different data sets and using different methods, and you get the similar result, or you look at the same data, but you look at different restrictions, and you can then match that up historically to what you see in RCT, you're looking for some way to map your data back to something that gives you greater confidence in the results that you're seeing. Let me add something to that, too. I agree with everything that's been said. Um, um, uh, but building on uh, what, what Mark just said, sometimes the clinical trial hasn't been done yet because um, you know, it wasn't feasible to do it. And so uh, that was the case with a woman's, uh, an exercise like Schneeweiss's has been done by a lot of people after the uh, Women's Health Initiative to show how you, know, you restrict the data in various ways and, and the, the outcomes and treatments and, um, and some subgroups of the population and the time frames that you're looking at, you can reproduce the same results from observational data as were in the trials. But the key is to look for heterogeneity in your treatment effect uh, uh, across subgroups and over time uh, at the outset. Because often the clinical trial, the cl definitive clinical trials have already been done, then you don't need to be doing this. You're doing this because they, they perhaps haven't been done yet. So even if there's no clinical trial to appoint, to, um, uh, uh, to relate to, you should have subject matter experts on your team so you can identify what the relevant uh, subgroups and time periods are so you can look for heterogeneity in your effect up front.